Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. I can see that we've got about uh, 39, 40 of you joining already, which is is great. Um, thank you for arriving uh, on time. Um, now, um, for those of you who don't know me and Nick and haven't worked with us yet, I was uh, called in 2005 and I practice across the range of commercial work uh, and I deal with a wide range of shareholder disputes, including unfair prejudice petitions. So this kind of thing is very much in my wheelhouse. Uh, Nick um, joined us uh, more recently. He's 2019 called, but he brings um, with him uh, a unique perspective in our team because uh, in a previous life, he qualified as a chartered accountant. And so his insight into corporate affairs, both on, on the general management and liability side, but also on the valuation side is invaluable, uh, as many of, of our other colleagues have already um, found because Nick has worked um, with some of our senior silks on a range of matters. Uh, okay, so our aim this morning is that each of us will speak for probably about 15 minutes, um, and I'll explain in a moment what uh, how we're going to break up the topics and what we're going to be talking about, uh, and that's with a view to then having some time for questions uh, from around 9.30 onwards, and depending on how that goes, we should um, finish the seminar this morning around quarter to 10. Um if you do um, have any questions for the question part of it, uh, what we would suggest in the first place uh, is using the Q&A function, which you should all have in your Zoom window. So you should be able to find, if you're not familiar with it, an icon at the bottom of your screen, Q&A. And if you click on that, that allows you to submit a question, which will then pop up in a list that Nick and I will be able to see, uh, and we'll be able to choose um, some of those questions to answer. And if those questions then lead into a discussion and uh, any of you want to um, come uh, on microphone, come on camera to deal with it, then that's fine. We'll deal with it that way. Um, if you feel more comfortable uh, asking a question just um, orally or putting it in the chat, that's fine too. We'll try and keep our eyes on all of that. Okay. So without um, further ado, because um, we're now, I think, up to um, most of the people that's, that signed on the attendance list, which is great, uh, I will put the uh, presentation up and we can get started. So we're going to screen share the slides um, that we've prepared for you. And then after today, we will circulate a copy of the slides so you have them. And we will also circulate a link to the video recording of this um, webinar. Okay, so hopefully you should now be able to see the title page um, of the presentation. Um, and... Um, if any of you are having any issues with that, no doubt Nick will uh, let me know if there's any problems with it. So the reason we have chosen to talk about this topic uh, is that, um, as many of you will be aware, uh, there was a significant decision handed down earlier this year uh, in which the Court of Appeal considered whether or not there was uh, a statutory limitation period for Section 994 petitions, and that was in the decision in Zedra Trust and THG PLC. So... What we are proposing to talk about is, first, I will talk um, a little about what the case actually decided. Then um, I'm also going to talk in the course of doing that, a bit of a detour into what remedies you can apply for under Section 996 of the Companies Act in the first place. Um, because at first blush, um, one of the findings in Zedra might not seem to affect that many of us because um, there's a shorter limitation period for money claims and who brings a money claim in an unfair prejudice petition. But in fact, it's something that now you have to give more thought to given that there is a shorter limitation period. Um, then Nick is going to talk about um, some particular aspects arising from the decision, questions of delay and questions of how you, you're going to plead your allegations. Um if you're the petitioner trying to get around potential limitation problems, and if you're a respondent, how you're going to respond to it and what tactics you might take. Uh, and Nick is going to finish up as well, talking about the decisions that have taken place since then and the cases that are referred to, etc. Uh, first, a big health warning, uh, which is that the Court of Appeal judgment in this case was um, delivered on the 23rd of February of this year, but... Um, not long afterwards, on the 23rd of May this year, permission to appeal to the Supreme Court was granted. Now, at this point, I, I'm not able to say the details of um, the basis on which permission to appeal was granted. Whether it goes to the core of what we're talking about and the limitation issue, I'm not sure, because 
there was also an aspect of the Court of Appeal decision, which was about how the doctrine of the precedent works, which we're not going to be talking about that today. Um, but that may be the thing the Supreme Court is more interested in. Um, really, the health warning is is this. What we say today is intended to be the law as it is today. Um, and it may well change when the Supreme Court comes uh, to deal with it. But if you've got an unfair prejudice petition and if you've got a limitation concern, you need to act on the basis um, of that there are limitation periods that now apply and you shouldn't uh, postpone it or wait uh, in the expectation that the law might change. So um, the Zedra case itself, um, we don't need to go into the fact in a lot of detail because really the, the point the Court of Appeal decided was one of principle. But this was a petition brought by Zedra, a minority shareholder at around the 10, 11% um, mark in terms of um, capital and voting rights. The respondents, when the petition was originally um, commenced, were 14 named directors and former directors of THG PLC, i.e. The, the Hutt Group. Now, the petition had originally been started on the 8th of January 2019. Um, and as you'll have noticed, the decision we're talking about was February of this year. So uh, it took a while to get to this point. And when the petition was originally commenced, it included um, an allegation about a range of share allotments between February 2016 and May 2018, I think 10 of them in total. And there were allegations that the allotments um, had been issued in bad faith and for improper purposes, ultimately with the aim of diluting this minority shareholder and prejudicing their position. There was a, a substantial application to strike out that allegation or large parts of it, um, which didn't succeed at first instance, but then on appeal to the Court of Appeal, most of it got um, struck out and stripped away on the basis that there were insufficient facts pleaded to establish the allegation. So there were essentially assertions of bad faith and improper purpose without the material from which the court could actually infer that was the case. And so by June 2022, um, the petition and large parts of it had fallen away and there wasn't much left. Uh, and it wasn't in terms of unfair prejudice actually going so well. So in June 2022, the petitioner uh, applied to make certain amendments which were envisaged by the Court of Appeal strikeout decision. And in particular, they wanted to allege that they had a contractual right to participate in some of those share allotments I referred to a moment ago, uh, and that hadn't been done properly because their preemption right hadn't been disapplied in the correct manner. But they also wanted to allege that they'd been wrongly excluded from a bonus share issue in July 2016. Um, and the timing of that bonus share issue becomes significant, as we're going to see. At first instance, on hearing this application to amend, Mr. Justice Fancourt, Vice Chancellor, uh, refused permission for the uh, first um, major complaint, and that was by far the bigger in value of the two. But he granted permission for the second one. Now, on the first one, the resistance to the amendment was uh, you know, adequately pleaded, and there isn't evidence to sustain it for the purposes of granting permission to amend, and the judge agreed with that. On the second one, it was accepted that the pleading passed the merits test. There was enough in it. There was enough evidence. And really, therefore, the only question was limitation. Because by the time the court was coming to consider whether to grant permission to amend, it was now more than six years um, since the bonus share issue had happened. Uh, and Mr. Justice Fancourt decided uh, that um, there was no basis on that ground, the limitation ground, for him to refuse the amendment because he was um, bound by Charity Hill Skip Hire Limited to find that there was no statutory limitation period applicable to a Section 994 petition. Um, but he granted permission explicitly on the basis that um, questions of delay um, weren't completely gone. Um, the respondents would be entitled to raise at trial the question of delay uh, as a reason for the court to refuse to grant relief, even if it was satisfied there was unfair prejudice, or potentially a reason for saying there was no unfair prejudice in the first place at all. But that was something that had to happen at trial and not at the application to amend stage. So what was Cherry Hill skip hire? And why uh, had the judge thought he was bound to find that there was no limitation period? This was um, an unusual case. Um, and that is a relevant factor as to why the Court of Appeal perhaps found in Zedra that it wasn't a case um, that was binding or needed to be followed by Mr. Justice Fancourt or by them. And in this case... Um, the petitioner had been excluded from management originally, I think, some 37 years before the petition was commenced. And he then threatened 
um, about 17 years before the petition commenced to issue a petition if matters weren't resolved. And then he did, uh, on the face of it, nothing at all for a further 17 years before issuing the petition. So one can well see that in that case, um, the facts pointed strongly towards the conclusion that this was late, stale, shouldn't be allowed, he'd acquiesced, etc. Um, it was listed for a preliminary issue decision on whether indeed it should be dismissed on the grounds of delay uh, and or acquiescence. And at first instance, Stephen Davis did dismiss the petition. Uh, on appeal, um, the main meat of the uh, appeal decision was about um, whether or not a passive shareholder is obliged to inform themselves about what's going on in the business, um, to which the Court of Appeal said, well, well, no, you've got an expectation that the business is being managed properly. And that's why uh, they reversed the first instance decision and said, well, the, the shareholder was entitled uh, not to uh, intervene in the business, and therefore you can't say he's acquiesced. But in the course of considering the question of delay, almost as a throwaway remark, uh, later Justice Andrews had said, there is no statutory period of limitation applicable to our prejudice petitions. Uh, and the other judges on the panel, Lord Justices Lewison and Snowden, agreed um, with uh, Lady Justice Andrews in, a, in one word and um, concurrent judgments. Now, the appeal in Zedra to the Court of Appeal um, took this uh, on, uh, head on, and said, well, the judge had been wrong to say uh, that there was no limitation period applicable to unfair prejudice petitions. And on the face of it, they were facing um, quite an uphill struggle to do that, because as the Court of Appeal in Zedra said, there is some 40 years of received wisdom that the Limitation Act um, doesn't apply and there are no limitation periods. And it wasn't just um, the Cherry Hill case. It was a number of other cases that were referred to um, and it was virtually all of the practitioner texts on companies and shareholder rights. Uh, and it was also two law commission reports, which had all said the same thing. There is no statutory limitation period. Um, but the Court of Appeal in Zedra, which, as it happens, also included both Lord Justices Snowden and Lewison, again, decided that what had been said in, in Cherry Hill Skipper was wrong. Uh, so I'm going to look now at how, how they got there, which involves... Um, a canter through section 994 and section 996 and then some of the aspects of the limitation act that apply to them so as we will um will be familiar with the jurisdiction to seek remedies on the grounds of unfairly prejudicial conduct of companies affairs it's a statutory creation uh, and the version we have in the 2006 companies act is is a successor to one previous version and historically it was about oppressive conduct instead but the important point is that this is a statutory creation, this jurisdiction for the court to intervene in the affairs of a company uh, on the petition of a, a shareholder in this way. And the most typical path is that the minority shareholder, and usually it is a minority shareholder, um, petitions on the grounds that the company's affairs are being or have been conducted in a manner that's unfairly prejudicial to the interests of members generally or of some part of its members. Sometimes uh, it's about a particular act or omission, but by and large, in my experience, it's about general conduct of the business. So those are the grounds on which one can advance the petition. And then section 996 deals with remedy. And both parts here are equally important. So if the court is satisfied that a petition is well-founded, it may make such order as it thinks fit for giving relief in respect of the matters complained of. And the breadth of that power to grant relief is critical, both to this decision, but also more generally in considering what you're going to do in relation to an unfair prejudice petition. And it's the sort of wording that will be familiar, for example, to those of you who do some insolvency work as well. So there are various provisions which we're going to touch on later, which uh, give the court a power to make such order as it thinks fit to restore the position as was before a challenged antecedent transaction, for example. Um, but Section 996 um, was uh, worded in a way that uh, then goes on to specify certain things that the court may do without prejudice to the generality of the broad power. Uh, and this is the bit that many of us will be more familiar with. So there is the power to regulate the conduct of the company, is a fair, as which certainly I've occasionally pleaded it. Um, or, um, secondly, a power to require the company to not do or to do something. Uh, a power to authorise proceedings to be brought in the name of on behalf of the company, so effectively a, 
roundabout way of getting to a derivative action, um, requiring the company not to make alterations to articles without the leave of the court, so about effectively entrench certain things in the articles to protect prejudiced shareholders. And finally, and this is the one that most of us probably see most often by far, um, the power to um, make a buyout order to provide for the purchase of the shares of any members of the company, not necessarily just the petitioner, by other members of the company uh, or by the company itself. Now, this list is not um, prescriptive. And even starting with the buyout uh, order, for example, a buyout order can be made um, against people other than the company or the other members of the company, uh, just as an example. And then I've set out in this slide, um, by way of a, a detour briefly into the other remedies that are available to help us appreciate the, the breadth of this power, some of the other things um, that have either been order, ordered or have been thought to be possible, at least. Um, so it is, for example, in the context of if, if the court is making a buyout order saying that the petitioner's shares have to be bought, the court can uh, also make an order that a loan owed to the petitioner by the company is paid at the same time. Um, similarly, um, the court may uh, order, if a buyout order has been made, an interim payment on account of the share purchase price, which can either be done under the CPR or under the broad power under Section 9961. There's also a power to order um, interest or quasi-interest, effectively damages compensation in the nature of interest on the share purchase price if it's not paid at the time it should have been. Um, but there's also, and this is where we start to get to the point of more interest in, in Zertra Trust itself, um, orders for the directors or third parties to compensate the company or account for profits plus inquiry. So that's an order requiring people to pay money into the company, um, which may then be accounted for in the company in the usual way to the benefit of the petitioning shareholder. But there's a step further, and this is my last bullet point here, in an earlier stage of the Hutt Group litigation itself, the same case, uh, David Richards uh, in the Court of Appeal had said that it was possible in principle to make an order for wrongdoing directors to pay compensation directly to the petitioner. And that is so even without needing to show that the directors owe a fiduciary duty to that director, because obviously ordinarily the, the reason why a claim for compensation like this by a petitioner falls down is that the duties owed by the directors are owed to the company, not to an individual shareholder. Um, but David Richards said, well, look, in principle, this is possible, and you don't need to show that the directors owe this petitioner uh, a fiduciary duty. And it was this was in the context of talking about amendments that might be down the line. And this is what the petitioner in the Zedra case was seeking to obtain by the complaint for which permission to amend was allowed. They were seeking uh, compensation um, to put them in the position they would have been had the bonus share ever assumed and been done properly. So with that in mind, in terms of the breadth of relief and the statutory nature of the jurisdiction, how the court reasoned that limitation um, periods do apply. First, a Section 994 petition is an action within the meaning of the Limitation Act 1980. They had to put that point to bed, um, so there was no doubt about that. Secondly, um, a Section 994 petition is not a claim for equitable relief. So talking about equitable constraints, for example, in the case of a quasi-partnership, talking about breach of duties by the directors, breach of fiduciary duties, that can be a distraction into leading one to think that a Section 994 petition is a claim for equitable relief. And therefore, you might be in the realm of, of having to navigate through Section 36 of the Limitation Act and limitation periods by analogy. Court of Appeal said, no, it's a statutory creation uh, and it is not to do with uh, equitable relief. Then the claim under Section 994, um, they broke it into two. Um, and the, in the first place, they said, um, well, it's an action upon a specialty within Section 81 of the Limitation Act 1980, to which a 12-year limitation period applies. And this is a, a curious provision which um, has cropped up from time to time, I suppose, in the last 20 years or so. And from my own perspective, it, it came up more in the context of dealing with things like consumer credit and unfair credit relationships and such like. Um, but there is this provision which applies on the face of it to claims um, based on obligations arising under statutes. And I've included there, I was trying to find a useful definition of specialty. And I think in a way, this was probably the most useful thing I find I found because it confirms that it's got an imprecise meaning. Um, so on the one hand, it refers to things like um, documents under seal and, and deeds under seal. 
but it also refers to obligations arising under statutes. So the Court of Appeal found that, well, the Section 994 claim, it is an action upon a statute. It's a statutory creation, and therefore, in the first place, there's a 12-year limitation period. But under Section 82, uh, the 12-year period doesn't apply if there is a shorter period prescribed for the action in question under any other provision of the limitation at 1980. And what they decided was that there is a relevant other provision, which is Section 9, an action to recover any sum recoverable by virtue of any enactment, for which six years is the period. Now, um, this gives rise to some difficult questions in the context of Section 994 petitions, but two key points I, I, I raise here. The first is that this confirms that just because it's a Section 994 petition, it doesn't mean there's one limitation period. It depends on the relief you're claiming. But secondly, it also depends on the substance of the relief you're claiming. So one has to look very carefully if you're responding to it. Uh, and if you are the petitioner, one has to think carefully about how you put it. But if you're trying to deal with limitation problems or assert a limitation defense, you have to look at what is the substance of it. Is this actually a claim for monetary compensation masquerading as something else? Or is this in substance a claim for non-monetary relief? Uh, and there's some interesting discussion, etc., about, well, what amounts to a claim for monetary relief in this context? One can see, for example, that uh, a claim for compensation, for money compensation, is straightforwardly for monetary relief. Um, but why is a buyout order not also a claim for monetary relief? Because at the end of it all, what you as petitioner want is an order requiring one or more respondents to pay you X pounds in return for your shareholding. But the Court of Appeal cut that off and said, no, buyout orders uh, are a, a form of non-monetary relief. And even though there is money changing hands at the end of it, that's part of the mechanism for achieving the share purchase, the actual relief for the purposes of working out whether you're um, within Section 9 of the Limitation Act or not, uh, is a buyout order, which is not in itself monetary relief. And I I've just put a, um, a little note there to, um, I'm not going to, to dwell on it, um, but I, there's an interesting comparison in the case with certain provisions of the Insolvency Act relating to um, trading while insolvent, transaction at undervalue, and transaction defaulting creditors. Because certainly when I read Zedra first, my reaction was, well, surely an action to recover sums recoverable by virtue of any enactment uh, is for things like, for example, uh, compulsory purchase where you're entitled to a sum of money to be determined by somebody if um, if your property is appropriated, there is clearly a statute providing for you to be paid a sum of money, whereas a statutory cause of action where the court has got to consider first whether your action is established and then what relief to grant you, that doesn't seem like a sum recoverable by virtue of any enactment. But that that's not how it is looked at by the courts. And there is a, a lengthy discussion in Zedra, all the different comparable sorts of actions. And it is clear that there's a much more simple way that you have to look at it. You want to ask the questions, by virtue of what has this sum of money become payable to this person? And if the answer is a statutory provision, then it is an action to recover a sum recoverable by virtue of any enactment. It doesn't matter that to get to the point of a sum being recoverable, you've got to have um, consideration of liability and the court's discretion. Okay. Um, what about Cherry Hill? Well, it was found that this wasn't binding on the Court of Appeal. So the Court of Appeal was saying that its own previous decision wasn't binding um, for essentially two reasons. The first, um, the question whether there was a limitation period wasn't actually argued or decided. And that's correct in Sherry Hill. It was stated in the judgment, but it wasn't a point that had actually been um, gone into in any detail. And a connected reason as to why it wasn't binding the court had simply used that as an assumption of what the law was when applying the facts of the case to it and hadn't looked at it in any detail. Now, this may be the point that's of more interest to the Supreme Court, etc., um, but we, that remains to be to be seen because it's very significant if the Court of Appeal can um, uh, not follow a previous decision of its own on this kind of basis. Right, um, I'm going to move through um, my next few slides relatively quickly because these are, in most cases, more practical points, which Nick is going to pick up on. The decision gives rise to some potential headaches in relation to well, what do you do about events that have happened a long time ago. So the Cherry Hill case, for example, involved events going as much as 37 years ago. And the upshot of it is in broad terms, and I'll, I'll state what I think is the principle and Nick can talk about practical ideas to deal with it. Um, you can still rely on events that have occurred more than 12 years or six years ago, depending on whether you're in a money claim or a non-money claim. 
Uh, you can't necessarily bring a petition relying solely on those historic events. But if you do have an in-time cause of action now, and those past events are relevant to the cause of action, and possibly are part of the reason why you say the more recent events are unfairly prejudicial, then you can plead them and rely on them. Um, and what that means is, is in practice, you're going to have to think very carefully about A, how much of the history is important, and B, what are the triggers for your cause of action? Is the more recent event enough to start time running again for a new cause of action? What about the question of delay? Um, and this now, in short, the, the point of principle is, well, if you've now got a statutory limitation period, can you actually strike out or summarily dismiss an action that's been brought within the limitation period? Uh, in short, maybe, but um, Lord Justice Lewison and Snowden decided it was better to leave that to a case where it actually matters, which wasn't the case uh, in Zedra. Um, then what if the petitioner doesn't find out about the matters of unfair prejudice? Section 32 potentially comes into play. And again, I think Nick is going to pick up on that in terms of the practicalities of how you look for relevant facts and how you plead them. And then my final point just have one eye on the fact that if you're going to be amending a petition to pursue a time-barred claim, um, you have to go through uh, the route of CPR 17.4. So uh, applying for permission to amend to bring a claim uh, after the expiry of the relevant time period. So if you want to do it within the same action, you have to show that it arises out of the same facts or substantially the same facts, failing which you have to bring a separate petition and then seek for them to be case managed and dealt with together. Okay, so that that's the end of my section. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my screen share and let Nick take over um, for his section. Uh, and I look forward to, to speaking to you all later, but if you have any questions. Okay, Nick, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Ben. Good morning, everyone. Let me just try and share my um, slides, which is always fraught with anxiety. Right, yes. As Ben said, um, my section of the talk will touch on some of the uh, practical tips for unfair prejudice positions post Zedra, and I will also briefly discuss the only, uh, so far that I'm aware of, two English reported decisions um, post Zedra, one of which in particular contains some very good um, illustrations of the types of issues that will arise from the tips I will discuss. Um, first, I should say I'm not never really be sure about the use of the word tips because it implies I've got some clever um, insights to uh, share. But these are really points which are plain and obvious from the judgment in Zedra itself. Um, I just want to really draw them out here as key takeaways for us as practitioners. Um, so really, firstly, the first tip, but it's not really a tip in particular, this one, because it is the most obvious points arising from the judgments, but I'm going to say it anyway. Now that we know that the Limitation Act in 1980 does apply and prescribes bright lines at six and 12 years, depending on the relief source, firstly, you need to think about the substance of what relief you are claiming and so what period applies. Um, if it is a purchase order, uh, as Ben said, we're looking at a 12-year period. If it is something more like equitable compensation or what we would characterize as a monetary wrong or the petitioner seeking payments of money to them directly or through some other means, not through adjustment to a purchase order, um, we're looking at six years. So with those periods in mind, really scrutinize any of your factual allegations that are being relied upon that have occurred um, further back in time and think about how to deal with them. So as Ben said... Zedra doesn't mean that you cannot rely upon those old allegations or that they shouldn't be pleaded. Um, and as we all know, it's really quite common in 994 petitions for unfair prejudice to be sought to be established effectively through cumulative acts, um, although uh, it could be a single event. But what the Court of Appeal has said and what we now need to think about is that the relevant date for limitation purposes is the point in time at which the petitioner first had sufficient grounds to issue a petition at that point in time um might therefore be somewhat of a great question when we're relying on cumulative acts and historically it's not something that we've really needed to give a great deal of thought to um but if you are acting for a petition and relying upon old allegations by which i mean allegations on their own which will be out of time my tip and it remains to be seen really how what practice evolves as to this but my tip would be 
um, if there's if there's any doubt as to the limitation, pin your colours to your mast in the pleading and say, this is the point in time at which unfair prejudice was established and we are therefore within time. Um, now, as we know, strictly speaking, limitation, it's a procedural defence that ought to be pleaded by a respondent here. So it's not necessarily something that you in every case need to anticipate. Um, but I think practitioners are going to be highly live to Zedra now. So you can probably expect that it is something that will be um, pursued. So I don't think there's any harm where you are obviously relying upon old allegations um, to pin your colours to the mast in that way. Um, second tip, as Ben said, um, consider uh, Section 32 of the Limitation Act, where you've got perhaps old allegations, are out of time allegations essentially, but where your petitioner did not know about them and couldn't reasonably have known about them until a date that is within time. Um, Section 32, in particular, subsections 1b um, should assist and therefore suspend time from running until the petitioner could um, or did discover that fact. This is effectively deliberate concealment. Um, I've set out on the slide there the um, recently restated three-stage test from uh, Potter and Canada Square as to what you need to establish for Section 32, subsection 1B, uh, type of defence to a limitation defence. Um, namely, firstly, a relevant fact um, that's relevant to the cause of action. Secondly, concealment of that fact by the respondent from the petitioner. Um, and thirdly, an intention by the respondents to conceal that fact. It, it's clearly not difficult to envisage in case of unfair prejudice that this might happen relatively regularly, um, although I would expect there might now be a lot of satellite arguments about whether, say, financial dodgy practice that was not actually known to a petitioning director shareholder actually should have been known by them if they were themselves properly fulfilling their right director's duties, one can imagine the respondents saying, um, but still, certainly Section 32 is a, a possible tool. Third tip, uh, and again, Ben's um, nicely foreshadowed this, but if the petitioner has suffered what we might call a distinct monetary wrong, which we would want to seek some sort of remedy for, clearly there is a significant difference in time between 6 and 12 years. 12 years is quite a long time, and that is the uh, applicable limitation period in what we might call a vanilla a non unfulfilled petition where the remedy sought is a purchase order, which we'd all be very familiar with. But as Ben has highlighted when talking about um, how the court can fashion relief under Section 996, the court has a broad discretion and power to make adjustments to the purchase price to reflect monetary wrongs done to a petitioner. For example, a failure to repay a director's loan account or some other um, form of possible harm to their direct financial interests. And what Zedra seems to say, and this seems to be borne out in all the decisions that I will discuss, there was really nothing preventing the way in which relief is sought for that monetary wrong um, as being pursued through an adjustment to the purchase price and the petitioner saying, well, you haven't repaid me, say, my director's loan, and so I'm going to ask for the purchase price um, and buy the value of the company to be adjusted to uh, reflect that. Um, what Zedra says, and this this is, seems to be clear from other authorities as well in other areas of law, a petitioner, like any other claimant, is free to formulate their case in a way which takes advantage of a more favourable limitation approach. And um, the Court of Appeal of Zedra talks about the example of in professional negligence, you can either bring a claim often in contracts or torts, and those both have slightly different limitation periods that apply. So if the substance of what you are seeking and what you really want is a purchase order, a buyout order. That's a binary thing. You either want your shares bought out or not. And it's, in my view, going to be very difficult for a respondent to argue that a pleaded claim for a purchase order is really anything other than that in substance. And as a court's to look at the substance of what is sought, um, you can possibly get round the issue of a six-year limitation period by saying, okay, well, if we really want purchase order, let's just adjust that and seek... Um, uh, the monetary wrongs to be remedied through that. The final bullet on this slide, um, it's not really a tip, but a uh, food for the thought, which again, Ben um, has foreshadowed. By their very nature, um, unfair prejudice petitioners, as we know, cover conducts ranging over a long period of time. These are time-consuming, 
things to often plead and prove. They're detailed and therefore expensive to litigate. Um, and as part of case managing, what can become very unwieldy cases, uh, grounds of delay, acquiescence, et cetera, have sometimes been used to justify um, strike out of summary judgments of such petitions. I mean, the Court of Appeals now have said it's not an extra remedy, so forget late cheese. Um, so post Zetra, we now have a situation in which, say, a purchase order remedy is sought. For limitation purposes, in principle, there's no, nothing wrong with going back to conduct um, at least 11 years and, say, 11 months ago. So has the Court of Appeal um, opened a proverbial can of worms here and given license to petitioners to potentially pursue older and staler claims than they otherwise would have done? Um, well, firstly, Lord Justice Snowden expressly says no, and the Court can still um, strike out claims for inordinate delay in appropriate cases. But as Ben said said we're going to leave it to a case where it matters um secondly i'm personally skeptical that prior to zedra there were many uh, that many aggrieved prospective petitioners considering issuing who had not because they were advised that delay would be so obviously fatal to their claim that they wouldn't not issue so it probably won't make much difference in terms of what actually comes through but certainly the interplay between delay and the limitation act will i suspect become a feature whenever delay is raised and as we shall now see in one of the cases that I will discuss. Uh, so there are, as I say, two post Zedra reported decisions, um, as far as I know. Uh, the first was where Zedra needs to be engaged with more substantively, so I'll discuss that in more detail. The other I will touch on much more briefly. Um, first decision is, is Reed Candy, otherwise known as uh, Tom and Candy. The petitioner was Mr. Tom. Uh, the respondent is the uh, eponymous and quite well-known boutique law firm uh, the facts in brief really one of the founders mr tom um was subject to what he said was unfairly prejudicial conduct which ultimately led to his uh, resignation as a director of the company on the 15th of october uh, 2015 petition was presented 28th of october 2022 so more than six years after the date of resignation so you can probably see where the respondents were going with their um, application Remember, the court will look at the substance of what is being claimed, um, but just at a high level, what was pleaded. Well, firstly, Mr. Tom sought um, an order for the purchase of his share to buy out order. Not as obviously liable to attack, really, uh, because we know that's a 12-year period. Um, secondly, he sought what was effectively payments of sums found uh, due and owing to uh, him, or an adjustment to the purchase price to reflect such um, sums found you knowing. So we've got what are really here, I suppose, monetary wrongs. So we're more on the territory of potentially a six-year period. There were two sources of those. Firstly, there was, um, let's call it the simplicity, um, uh, a claim for repayments to the director's loan accounts, DLA. And secondly, a claim for commission that he said was due to him from um, what was then the company for introducing a sub matter the company pursued and, and, and successfully settled. Um, but what the uh, petitioner actually said at the hearing of the application was that he was only seeking an ind independent claim as for monetary wrong or compensation in respect to the commission payments, so not the DLA repayment. The DLA repayment was clearly older, I think, and outside of the six-year window. And all he said in respect to the DLA was that this was an amount which ought to be reflected in the purchase price. Um, and that's really the key point. The respondents applied to strike out really on the basis of the Limitation Act, post cetera, um, effectively said claims of specific sums are time barred by Section 9 of the Limitation Act. Um, and they also said, where in substance claims for relief are founded on a breach of agreements, contracts, or characterised as a debt claim. So this is the um, claims for the DLA, repayments of the DLA, because it arose under a type of agreement, um, and the commission. And the petitioner, Mr. Tom, would have a parallel cause of action in the breach of contracts or debts, and those hypothetical claims would be time-barred. This petition ought to be struck out because there's essentially no real prospect of obtaining relief under Section 9. 96 at trial, a so-called limitation act by analogy type defence. Um, and they further said, in any event, 
uh, he's acquiesced in the conduct and delayed in bringing proceedings as a tactical attempt to um, benefit from a, ri- a, ra- a rise in the price of the share price. It really was a, a, a very much a full frontal attack on the petition on any conceivable ground of delay or limitation. Um, I've also said there on the slide, if you want to have a very helpful summary of Zedra, you clearly have our slides here, um, but, but do look at section, uh, excuse me, paragraph 32 of Candy uh, for quite a punchy um, and very helpful seven paragraph summary of, of what Zedra says. So what was the outcome of Candy? Well, the respondents were unsuccessful on every single basis. Uh, it's a well sort of uncomprehensively and quite clearly reasoned judgment um, of the um, Insolvency and Company Court Judge Greenwood, I think. Um, but in short, the reasons being the, the respondents' submissions, in my view, concern a slightly heroic attempt to try and frame, as I say, the claim for repayment of the DLA as being a claim for a specific sum. Um, but the judge said it wasn't. Uh, the failure to repay the DLA was expressly pleaded as being a ground of unfair prejudice and the non-payment of that DLA therefore ought to be reflected in the price of a purchase order. And the remedy he was seeking off the back of all of this was a purchase order. It's a totally different beast to claim for that than for a specific sum was a type of contractual remedy. It might well be that these are different ways of arriving at basically the same end goals for the petitioner, but Mr. Tom, as the petitioner, is free to formulate his case in that way. There was also a, uh, as I say, another slightly this heroic attempt to uh, argue that a six-year period ought to apply by analogy to events relating to the DLA, because essentially the underlying rights of repayment of the DLA is something that is contractual. Again, the, the judge re- rejected this because he said there's no need to apply the act by analogy where there is now an express limitation period in through the act. Um, interestingly, though, the judge did say that because and the respondents, they said this because the respondents had relied in this case on, upon the case of CF Booth, there might be some cases that when determining what is a fair remedy and basically perhaps adjusting the purchase price at the buyout order, the court might nevertheless have regards for different different limitation period when carrying out a company evaluation. Say, for example, a company asset, which would otherwise be used to determine the value of a company, is itself a possible claim, which is itself statute barred. That asset, that asset might therefore be disregarded as part of their valuation, but that is not inconsistent with Zedra, and that certainly didn't justify strike out here. Um, the claim for unpaid commission, which recall was pursued as a freestanding um, claim for a monetary wrong, that was also held to be not out of time. Um, firstly, because uh, a limitation defence hadn't been pleaded against that, and the judge said it ought to have been to be relied upon as a defence. Um, but, but secondly, and more substantively, the judge said, well, it's not a simple thing. Oh, okay, well, we'll apply to amends to plead that as a defence because having um, been through the facts and analysed, the um, again, the pleadings, the judge essentially said, uh, held it was not clear when the cause of action for the unpaid commission actually accrued, whether even um, time had started to run. So it certainly wasn't clear on a summary basis whether time had run out. Um, finally, uh, what about um, strike out for delay? Uh, because essentially here the respondent saying, okay, well, we're within time. They're within time for the Limitation Act 1980. Um, if you're against us with all our previous arguments, but the court nevertheless still retains the discretion to strike out following Zedra. And this really um, elides two types of um, delay type arguments. The first is what we might characterise as pure delay um, in the sense of a petitioner's attempt to rely upon purely old and historic allegations. And here the judge said, following Zedra, um, yes, okay, it seems the Court of Appeal have said that you can still strike out, but in uh, in the judge's language, it's a high hurdle to surmount that. Um, that's a claim that is otherwise brought within time or to be struck out for delay. Um, my own view is that high might be even understating it, and it would be a brave first instance judge to strike out um, even simply old allegations that are now known to be within time for limitation purposes. The second type of delay um, which again was held not to be applicable on the facts here, but in my view seems to be remained sort of untouched uh, by Zedra, 
are cases where a petitioner deliberately delays in presenting the um, petition to tactically um, benefit from a rise, potential rise in the share price uh, following um, the unfairly prejudicial conduct, and also normally coupled with conduct from which effectively acquiescence to the series of events uh, could be said to have occurred. Now, it's long been established that this type of conduct, this type of tactical manoeuvre by a petitioner, can be held to amount to warranting either summary dismissal or a ground for denying relief at um, the final hearing. The courts basically say in such situations that you as the petitioner have made an election to remain as a shareholder and potentially um, benefit from a rise in the share price and therefore held off issue of your petition and so you have potentially risked being denied relief. So that's likely to remain a substantive ground of challenge um, and possibly even at a summary stage. Uh, but I would caution that it is, uh, as ever, quite uh, challenging to evidentially establish that at an interim stage. But certainly it, it's unclear, and I, in my view, it's um, the uh, strikeout for delay, the pure delay, um, will now, where cases have been brought within time, I, I think that would be quite a challenging thing to pursue. But it's still, the door's still open, and we'll we'll see how it plays out. Finally, um, I'm only going to touch on this extremely briefly because I'm conscious we're over time, and this really was a decision that is, um, as we say, confined to its facts. Um, essentially, this was Queensgate Place. Uh, it's a decision where quantum... Um, decision on quantum where Cedra was handed down in between the liability decision and uh, before quantum and part of what was sought through the, um, the, uh, the quantum stage in terms of the um, purchase order was uh, adjustments for a number of shareholders repayments of shareholders loans which were made more than 12 years uh, post presentation of petition. The judge essentially said well look, I'm not going to allow this as a absolute bar to um, the purchase price being reflected in those loans because it wasn't pleaded or pursued at the liability stage, understandably clearly because Zedra had been handed down. So it's not strictly available to defence. Nevertheless, Judge said that um, he would consider um, that effectively these delay type arguments when formulating the remedy, um, but said that uh, it wasn't in fact the affirmative to the outcome. I say his decision is confined to his facts because if this had been litigated now, I suspect the respondent almost certainly would have pleaded an express limitation defence to the post-12 year loan repayment um, repayments uh, so it wouldn't have been uh, it wouldn't have been as much of an issue uh, and, and would have operated more as a clean defence at the both the liability stage and the remedy stage to those elements of the payments um, but, but otherwise it was a case where they're seeking a, um, a purchase order and um, so we're looking at the 12 year period Right. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry we've gone over. Um, that concludes my section of the talk. Um, unless we have any other questions, which I can't see in the chat or Q&A, um, or unless anyone else wants to raise something now, then I suspect, then unless you disagree, we will probably wrap up. Yeah, I, I think so. I just um, I had a couple of, of closing remarks. So I think the, the practical considerations there are very interesting. Certainly from my point of view, I think it, it, it makes... It doesn't necessarily make the exercise more difficult in advising clients, but it changes it a bit because whereas before you'd have to think about questions of delay, um, now you're having to think about that whole idea of, well, is the most recent uh, event in the sequence something that triggers another cause of action arising or do I have to potentially move now if I'm not confident that it is and that I might be about to be time barred? So I can see that being quite an acute question. Uh, and, and then, yeah, I think the thing about, um, I tend to agree that strike out for delay is going to be a very high hurdle because you effectively have to show either that the delay is abusive or that the court can be so confident at the interim stage that the court at trial is not going to grant relief. And that's very hard, um, to, to show in these kind of cases. But as you say, worth, worth pursuing potentially. And then finally, I think, um, Concealment is an interesting angle. But for my own part, my own take on Potter is that it, though in some senses it simplifies what you need to do to show concealment, um, I think in some ways it makes it a bit more um, difficult to do it because the emphasis is so much on showing a deliberate act of concealment and intention 
whereas before Potter there was perhaps more room to infer that uh, there was deliberate concealment, particularly in the context of those who owe fiduciary duties, etc. Um, so we'll, th- th- those are points that, uh, that remain to be seen. That's a bit of further th- food for thought to leave people with. Um, I can see one um, question has popped up uh, about the slides. And yes, a, a, co- a copy of the slides will be circulated, uh, as will a link to the recording of the webinar, um, which I think will be later today or tomorrow. Uh, right, unless anyone has anything further, I also would like to thank you um, for your time. Um, and if uh, anybody would like to ask me or Nick anything uh, after the session, then just uh, get in touch with us. You know, you know where we are. You know where our clerks are. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Thanks all.